Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover the seven book Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling. These were books 32 through 38 for my 2021 reading list. Well, quick note before I get started, this was the very first time I ever read these books. I've not watched the movies. I've not looked at other notes about what other people thought of the books. Uh, I just, I wanted to read them. I had never read them before and I finished it late last night. So I didn't have a whole lot of an idea of what I was getting into other than just knowing that in some Christian circles, these books were not looked upon favorably just because they contain witchcraft and wizardry. But I, I, I was curious because they, they seem to have touched a chord with so many people and so many people like the movies. They like the books. I mean, there's a theme park. So it, it, it raised my curiosity to, to want to dig in and know what was in these books and what, what was, what was so intriguing about them. Uh, but before I get into, to some initial thoughts, uh, wanted to, to just cover the, the scope of this episode. Uh, there'll be three more segments after this one. In the next segment, segment two, I'll cover some things that I loved about these books, as well as my favorite quotes from each book. In the third segment, I'll cover some ideas that stood out across all of the books. And then in the final segment, I'll do what I always do, and that is to finish it with the one thing, my one key takeaway from this series. So back to some initial thoughts. One thing is I read it as if it was true. And if you look, listen to some of my earlier episodes this year, you'll, you'll remember that for Lord of the Rings, I was having trouble with that one. Uh, I read The Hobbit and I just, I, I was having trouble getting through it. And I, I got to the point where I was wondering if I should just scrap the rest of the series because I, I just did not enjoy The Hobbit. And so I, I mentioned that on social media, and one of my friends wrote back and said, read it as if it's true. And that changed everything for me, and and uh, I, I really enjoyed the rest of the Lord of the Rings series. So I took that mindset into the Harry Potter series here. I read it as if it was true. And I know for myself that if I wouldn't have done that, I would have just viewed this as silly. Like, I, I, I would have just kept thinking the entire time, why am I reading about something that is not true in the sense of uh, these being real people. So I could I could instead be reading a historical account about uh, World War II or, or some other period of history. Why not do that where I'm actually learning something and that knowledge may help me? I, that's just kind of the mindset I would go into it if I didn't view it as serious, if I didn't view it or read it as if it was true. So I wanted to encourage you with that as well. If, if you ever have trouble with books, just kind of flip your mindset and, and you, you, you almost have to trick yourself to get into it, but just read it as if it would, if it's true. And for this Harry Potter series that I, I think it, it really helped me to call it or cause, caused me to, to enjoy it uh, much more than if I hadn't have done that. Uh, overall, I was, I was very impressed with the series. I just marveled constantly at the foresight of J.K. Rowling. Just, I mean, how do you think about that? It's 4,100 pages. How how do you plan that? Like, how do you put that together and write it in, 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 in I think she did like a book a year type thing. Like, how do you, how do you keep everything together? How do you know that this thing in book two is going to resolve itself in book seven? And in, in a way that twists, like you, you're not, you may not be expecting it. Like the imagination that it took to create this series just blew me away. Um, so that, that was, that I was just so impressed the, the entire time I was reading the series. Uh, the first few books in particular reminded me of, of reading Agatha Christie novels. Uh, those are mystery novels. And I, I've done a few of those for this reading project. And th they had that type of a feel where you're, you're kind of introduced to different people throughout the book and there's some clues as to what might happen um, and then there's there's so there are some murders and who who done it type of thing and so the first few really had uh, that similar 
type of, of feel for me. Uh, the later ones, not as much, but but the initial ones did. Another thing, uh, just me personally with these books, uh, and I don't know if it's just that I knew that they were filmed uh, partly at Oxford, uh, especially the in in the main rooms there uh, at, at Christ Church at, at Oxford, uh, where where you've got the dining hall there. Um, so I, I, I knew that. Uh, I hadn't seen it, but I, I knew that. And so I spent a summer at Oxford, the summer of 2000, I, I studied there. And so the entire time I was reading this, just the way uh, J.K. Rowling describes H- Hogwarts, uh, it just it reminded me of Oxford, and so I just had a ton of nostalgia while I was reading this book, just thinking back to those days at, at, at Oxford. And that, that was kind of the, I think, that w- that was what was going in my mind, is just kind of viewing the things I knew of Oxford as I was reading this book. So for reading stats, uh, it took me 77 hours and 36 minutes to get through all seven books. Uh, that was from September 7th of this year through November 3rd. Uh, which was last night. And so that was just under a couple months. Uh, I averaged 68 pages per day. Uh, There are 4,100 pages total, uh, 4,100 pages exactly. And so that was 68 pages per day. Now, this is very, very nerdy, but I, I, I love tracking this just to know how long books take me and then also to share that so you might know how, might, how, how long it might take you. Here's the time per page for each of the seven books. And, and there's a reason I'm doing this. First book took me a minute and seven seconds per page. The second book, a minute and four seconds. The third book, a minute and four seconds. The fourth book, a minute and eight. The fifth book, a minute and 17. The sixth book, a minute and five. The seventh book, a minute and six per page. So, all books were between a minute and four seconds and a minute and eight seconds, except for the fifth book, which was a minute and 17 seconds. And there was a little trick there because the, the the fifth book is actually the longest book, but then uh, the series I have, all books are the same size, but that fifth book, she put more words on each of those pages. And, and I, I, it looked like that uh, when I, when I first viewed the pages, uh, but it really, uh, confirm that when I saw how long it took me to read each of those pages. So in addition to being the most number of pages, there's also more words per page in that fifth book. So it is extra long. Uh, I, I know that's nerdy, but I, I love tracking that and, and also being able to, to share that. So next up, some things I loved about the book and some of the quotes that really stuck out to me from, from each of the books. Well, before I get into the next segment, I wanted to let you know of a way that you can support the podcast, and that is to help me purchase the books for next year's reading list. I have my 52 books picked for 2022, and I am excited about reading them. I still have about 10 books to go. You guys have been so kind, and you purchased probably between 15 and 20 of the books on my list for next year, so... The, the bookshelves are, are getting filled up, uh, but I still have about 10 left. And if you would like to support the podcast, uh, you can find in the show notes a link to an a- Amazon wish list of, of the books that I still have pending. Uh, I would really love if you purchased a book that you have read and, and something that's special for you and, and if you include a note with that. So if, you, if you'd like to support the podcast, that would make me so happy. It would help this project uh, by decreasing the amount of money I, I need to spend on books and the notes are there in the show notes. Look, and you'll find the the link there. So now back into this episode into segment two. Here are some things I loved about the Harry Potter series, and the first is this: that this world existed amongst the Muggles, and the Muggles are humans. So this wizard world, where where people are wizards, they're witches. It's it's amongst the the Muggles, and I, I guess you you can compare that to other fantasy novels or or. Uh, uh, fiction works where it maybe it's a separate world and it's just completely removed. But it it was so fun to see this happening within the world like that you and I might know. Uh, so and sometimes they overlap. So uh, a human, a, a muggle, uh, as they're called in this series, they might get a glimpse of the world of the wizard and they might see a wizard. They may they might see a witch. Um, but there's even spells that that can be cast to make the humans forget 
uh, that they've seen of, of something they've seen, or you'll you'll hear the humans explain something a, a way that that uh, wizards have done, and it's just it's I, I loved that about it, just that the two worlds were so close together. Uh, another thing I loved is when they played chess in in these series, the pieces on the board would, it would like had a life of their own. So the the knights were were moving around and they were they were they were they were actioned. There, there was action to them. It wasn't just a, a dumb piece that you were moving around. And uh, again, just to to J.K. Rowling's imagination, it's just uh, stuff like that throughout all these books that was that was just delightful. Um, there's this this aspect of uh, being able to remove memories from from their heads, and then being someone else being able to view those memories, and and even t- to the point where uh, when one of one one of the characters uh, is dying, he he takes out a memory out of his brain and hands it to Harry, and then Harry Potter can learn about. Uh, what what has happened to this person in his life, and so you just get this broader scope of the person's life. But but I guess just the, this idea it, w- it was an intriguing idea to to think that like memories can be these separate things, and and it it almost makes sense, like because memories will stick with us our whole lives, and and maybe they're not memories we want to have, but uh, they're there, and and this idea of being able to take those out and 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 share it with somebody. Um, but but that memory being like a physical object, it, it was just an, a really neat neat and intriguing way to think about memories. And then um, in in book four, <laughs> there's this chapter about, uh, and, and it's taking place at, at the school, and it's the the boys and girls asking each other out to the dance, and it was just so funny, and it was it was just perfect because. It was it was like how you remember that as 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 a kid, uh, the the nervousness, the tension, the the frustration of finding out who you wanted to ask had already been asked. Um, J.K. Rowling just nailed it in in that chapter, and and it was uh, really fun to read that. So I wanted to go through a few quotes that that stuck out to me in in each of the books. So in in the first book, um, call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for things. Fear of a name increases fear of the thing itself. End quote. Uh, so call evil for what it is. Call, uh, say the name. No one else in, in the book, very few, very few of the other characters would, would say the, the evil character's name out loud. Uh, but Harry would always say it. And, and uh, here's Dumbledore telling him, always use the proper name for things. Uh, the other quote, so I'm going to try to do two, two quotes per book. The other quote from book one, uh, there is no good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. And that was said by one of the evil characters. And it reminded me of another set of books from this year's reading list. And that was the Caro series about Lyndon B. Johnson. And that, that seems like something Lyndon B. Johnson would have said. There is no good or, good or evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. Uh, as, as If you listen to those episodes, you know LBJ was all about power and the, the moral sphere of things, the good and evil kind of went to the wayside uh, because power was the main thing. Here are a few from the second book, and here's Ron, Ron, uh, who is Harry's friend, talking about some books that the the ministry confiscated. So uh, here is he saying here some of the books that were confiscated. There was one that burned your eyes out, and everyone who read Sonnets of a Sorcerer spoke in limericks for the rest of their lives. And some old witch in Bath had a, a book that you could never stop reading. You just had to wander around with your nose in it, trying to do everything one handed. Uh, end quote. I just love that again. Uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, imagination, uh, just different these different books and, and how they would impact the rest of your life. It, it was quite, quite funny. Uh, the other quote from book two is this. It's our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities, end quote. And that ties into a major theme throughout this this reading project, uh, that being our, our daily choices kind of leading us in one direction or, or another. Uh, but that quote, it's our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. 
in book three, here's uh, of the first quote that sh- that uh, stuck out to me, and this was actually in the second book as well, but uh, I highlighted it here. Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. Uh, it, first thing that came to my mind when reading that is is just the algorithms that we trust in, and uh, they perhaps can't think for themselves, so maybe that's not the best example. But just if you can't see what's behind that algorithm or what's running, what you're viewing and seeing, then don't trust it. Uh, I, I, I just I, I like that. If you can't see its brain, but it can think for itself, don't trust it. The other quote in book three, the consequences of our actions are always so complicated, so diverse, that predicting the future is a very difficult business indeed, end quote. That reminded me of a lot of other books for this series where they pretty much say that it's impossible to to predict the future. And if, if you're reading a book that is full of predictions about the future, you should probably just put it down because it is very complicated. And as you see, if you read those books, you know, 20... 10, 20 years after they were written, almost nothing has has come out as predicted. Now to book four. If you want to know what a man's like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. If you want to know what a man's like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals, end quote. Uh, This one reminds me, uh, I worked with a gentleman in the UK for a while, and he, he, part of his interview process, he would take people to... Uh, a restaurant or uh, a gas station or something, and and he he would he would watch and observe how that person treated the waiter or waitress or the person uh, waiting on them at the at the gas station, and if that person kind of just with contempt uh, tr- treated that person, you know, just I'm um, just buying something from them, they don't matter. Uh, they had a pretty good idea of of what that person would be like. And and, and it's specifically for the, for the role that this person was looking at, it was important that they treated everyone kindly and and as a as a person and not just as a worker or something like that. So that quote made me made me think of that. Um, the other quote, all the all those substitutes for magic muggles use, electricity, computers and radar. Uh, again, that kind of ties in with the the things. One of the things I loved about this book were, of these worlds kind of coinciding. But, but the the muggles, the, the humans, like um, it, there's always always this. You know, they, they're trying so hard to do things that that the wizards and and um, and and witches and stuff could do naturally. And so, uh, the humans would have electricity and computers and radar to as substitutes for for magic. Just kind of a, a funny idea. Uh, for book five, I didn't have any uh, quotes that that stuck out. Uh, I mean, a lot of the ideas that I'll be talking about in the next segment they they are covered in all these books. Uh, so I'm going to skip to book six. So in book six, there's a quote right towards the beginning, on page eleven, and it's this: "The prime minister did not know what to say to this, but a persistent habit of wishing to appear well informed on any subject that came up made him cast around for any details that he could remember of their previous conversations." Let me let me read that one more time: "The prime minister, who did not know what to say to this, but a persist, persistent habit of wishing to appear well informed on any subject that came up made him cast around for any details he could remember of their previous conversations." End quote. I just I got a kick out of that one because I I do that personally. Like I I always just try to relate to people and and uh, I'll come up with the the dumbest stuff on any subject to try to to try to relate and and uh you know the guy in this book kind of got busted for for doing that and and uh it it, so it made it gave me a good chuckle and then the other one from uh book six is dumbledore dumbledore says people find it far easier to forgive others for being wrong than for being right thought that was a insightful full quote i'll do one quote from the final book so book seven Perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Those who, like you, have leadership thrust upon them and take up the mantle because they must and find it to their own surprise that they wear it well. That reminded me of Coke Stevenson in the second book of the Robert Caro series. He always would take power. He was running against Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1948 Senate race. 
Lyndon B. Johnson won. It was a stolen election. But the, the man he ran against, Koch Stevenson, he, he would always run a, after being called to run by people. Like he was there to solve a specific problem. He wasn't seeking his own glory, seeking his own political power. Uh, so this quote made me think of that. Perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Those who, like you, have leadership thrust upon them and take up the mantle because they must and find to their own surprise that they wear it well. The final quote that uh, stuck out that I thought was hilarious was a, a just kind of throwaway line where they're talking about somebody and they say, she's nutty as squirrel poo. She's nutty as squirrel poo. Now into segment three and some ideas that spanned across all of the books. The first, uh, I want to just cover some of the weaknesses for some of the main characters. And these weaknesses were described throughout. And so the, for the first, the the... The bad guy, the evil character Voldemort, his greatest weakness was his failure to understand that there are things much worse than death. Uh, this came up quite a bit, but he thought that by killing people, that was the worst thing. Uh, but, so, but his greatest weakness was a failure to realize that there are things much worse than that. For Harry, uh, Harry's greatest weakness was, was his love and in seeing others die for him. And I'll, I'll get in, into that more uh, uh, on, in the sense of love in, uh, later in this segment. And then for Dumbledore, who who was uh, who was Harry's mentor in a way, and, but kind of the wise figure uh, throughout the books, he carried, uh, in, in one instance, he cared more about happiness than truth for, and this was for Harry, he cared more about Harry's happiness than truth. And so he, he, he should have told Harry more things, but he didn't. And then uh, the other weakness for Dumbledore was that he believed the best about people. Here are some ideas that that stuck out that uh, that were really interesting. And then uh, uh, that so there the are four four ideas, and, and then some some quotes to go along with those. The, so the first was the that of the Dementors, and these were were the bad some of the bad guys. And so here's what Dementors are. Dementors are among the foulest creatures that walk this earth. They infest the darkest, filthiest places. They glory in decay and despair. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of the air around them. Even muggles feel their presence, though they can't see them. Get too near a Dementor, and every good feeling, every happy memory will be sucked out of you. End quote. The next section about the Dementors is about the Dementor kiss. So here's what happens when with the Dementor's kiss. It's what Dementors do to those they wish to destroy utterly. I suppose there must be some kind of mouth under there because they clamp their jaws upon the mouth of the victim and they suck out his soul. That gets into the next idea, and that is the soul. We see the soul show up throughout these books. And uh, in, in the paragraph right after what I just read about sucking out their souls, here is what happens. Oh no, said L Lupin. Uh, much worse than that, you can exist without your soul, you know, as long as your brain and heart are still working. But you'll have no sense of self anymore, no memory, no anything. There's no chance at all of recovery. You'll just exist as an empty shell, and your soul is gone forever. Lost. End quote. Uh, another part of, of the soul that comes up is that uh, Voldemort, the, the evil character, he has his soul split into seven parts. And as we find out in, in book six, the soul is supposed to remain intact and whole. Splitting it is an act of violation. It is against nature. Back to Voldemort's uh, greatest weakness. He wants Potter's, he wants to take Harry Potter's life, but not his soul. Um, but the, the reason this came up is, is we see the soul come up in, in so many different books, uh, so many different books for this reading project. And I, I'll, I'll describe the soul as, as that piece of us that, uh, that exists out, outside of our body in the sense that, uh, uh, the soul is not the material part of us, but it, uh, it is something that lasts beyond us. Uh, so past death, there, there is a soul, there, there is a part of you that, that, extends past that. I know, I know there's a, a 
the conception of, of a spirit that's separate than that as well. But for the sake of this book, you've got the body, you've got the soul, this, the, the, the idea that there is, that the soul is something that lives beyond that. Um, the Solzhenitsyn book, Gulag Archipelago, uh, that book, I, I, I said that book would not exist if it were not for the soul, because Solzhenitsyn talks about the soul all the time. He's, he says his soul was nurtured in the Gulag. His, his soul, despite the, the horrendous situation of, of being in a Russian Gulag, uh, his soul developed there. And, and this idea of, of there being something outside of the material aspect of us that that can that can go on, but just this idea uh, in in the Harry Potter series of being able to split the soul into seven parts, uh, just uh, it was just an interesting thing to to look at at the soul, um, and and it came up it came up all the time. There there was some discussion of, of the spirit as well, but but really the soul was was a big piece of it. The next after that is is love. And love shows up, and um, gosh, when you know you, you're reading the series, and and you, you get so you go get so involved in it, and and Voldemort is just the the personification of evil, like just uh, these dementors, they're sucking out souls, like there's just all this evil going on, and then you come across these passages of, about love and how love could destroy that, could could destroy that evil, could could annihilate that evil and and it just seems trite in a way it's not it but but perhaps it's it's a conception about it of 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 like the 1960s where just love man just love everybody um but but this idea of love and it, and it shows up all the time in in the bible too and and, and you, you take a step back and it's just it's kind of weird um why is love keep coming up like and and doesn't it kind of seem trite? Like this is pure evil here. We're talking about what? How is love going to do anything to combat that? And yet it does. And 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 yet it shows up over and over in this book as having more power over those things. And no matter how dire the situation, there there's this there's this aspect of hope, and it comes through the form of love. And it's not cheesy. It's not it's not this cheesy 1960s kind of love. Like it's it's. It, it's it's a real love. So I want to I want to just read some of these these quotes because it 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 was it was amazing, especially in contrast to the evil of of Voldemort. So in book one, your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. End quote. So Harry's mother, uh, she she dies trying to protect Harry, um, and that saves him from from a number of things in the book, like the courage of his mother, the, that mother's love that flowed through blood. And, and I'll talk about blood next, but, um, that protected Harry, the, the mother dying for him. Um, in a, a section in book six, it is impossible to manufacture or imitate love. Another section in book six, so uh, Dumbledore is talking to Harry, and um, and and so here and, and so they're going back and forth. Here's Harry, Harry saying, "But I haven't got uncommon skill or power," uh, said Harry before he could stop himself. And Dumbledore says this. He says, "Yes, you have," and he says that firmly. You have a power that Voldemort has never had. You can. And Harry says, "I know," and he says it impatiently. I can love. It was only with difficulty that that he stopped himself, adding, "Big deal." Yes, Harry, you can love," said Dumbledore, who looked as though he knew perfectly well what Harry had just refrained from saying. Which, given everything that has happened to you, is a great and remarkable thing. You are still too young to understand how unusual you are, Harry. So when the prophecy says that all have power the Dark Lord knows not, it just means love? asked Harry, feeling a little let down. Yes, just love, said Dumbledore. Uh, and, and that's the end of that, that section. But even there, um, you see how J.K. Rowling kind of captures that tension of 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 you're talking about these the, this evil, and then it's it's love that can that can go against that. Um, so that that was a, a really interesting. Uh, we get into book seven, and and it says this: you won't be killing anyone else tonight. 
and this is Harry talking to Voldemort. You won't be able to kill any of them ever again. Don't you get it? I was ready to die to stop you from hurting these people. That's Harry talking with Voldemort, and Voldemort's power is gone because Harry was willing to die, and he kind of does what his mother did at the beginning. He, She sacrificed herself, and that protected Harry. Harry sacrificed himself and that kept that that defeated that defeated the power of Voldemort. The final idea here that shows up throughout the books is is that of blood. And in the in book four, um, here here uh, Vold, Voldemort attacks Harry to get his blood and he, and here's the reason. Uh, and this is Harry telling Dumbledore about it and in in reference, the he he's referencing is Voldemort. He said my blood would make him stronger than if he'd used someone else's, Harry told Dumbledore. Dumbledore. He said the protection my my mother left me in me, he'd have it too. And he was right. He could touch me without hurting himself. He touched my face. That's the end of that quote. And then in book five, the fact that your mother died to save you, she gave you a lingering protection he never expected, a protection that flows in your veins to this day. I put my trust, therefore, in your mother's blood. I delivered you to her sister, her only remaining relative. While you can still call home the place where your mother's blood dwells, there you cannot be touched or harmed by Voldemort. He shed her blood, but it lives on in you and her sister. Her blood became your refuge. You need return there only once a year, but as long as you can still call it home, there he cannot hurt you. Your aunt knows this. I explained that I had done what I what I had done in the letter I left with you on her doorstep. She knows that allowing you house room may well have kept you alive for the past 15 years. End quote. So this idea that uh, that Harry's mother's blood has kept him alive um, and, and the blood that from from her sacrifice uh, is is what has protected Harry and it, and, and it's so strong that Vo- the evil the, that Voldemort cannot attack that and it's so strong that Voldemort wants it. Uh, just a lot going on in this, but uh, these four ideas, the, the Dementors, uh, the, the soul, love, and blood show up throughout this series. Now into segment four and the one thing. Well, last year I read the entire Bible for the first time, uh, front to back, and it was the first book on my list for 2020, and I just read it straight through. I'd never done that in my life. Uh, this year I read the New Testament, and I, I love seeing references to the Bible in the books that I read. And it, it's all over, I mean, and, and it's not, you know, it's not just saying, hey, I'm referencing the Bible here, like it. But they're they're all over the place, and and I just I love seeing that, and even the last segment where I, I highlighted some of those ideas, like you, you, those ideas are all throughout the Bible. Um, dementors, there's not dementors in the Bible, but there 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 are things like that, and and there's even ideas that that we can do that to our own souls of 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 gaining the whole world yet forfeiting our souls. Um, so you've got the soul, you've got you've got obviously you got love all over. Uh, in in the Bible, and you've in the idea of of blood in in blood uh, cleansing, and uh, so you see these ideas, and and I, I just love seeing that when when I'm reading books, and and saw saw it throughout this series as well. And so if I'm thinking of the one thing that that stands out, the the last idea I want to cover that is throughout these books is that of death, and. So here's some some quotes about that, and then just how it's described in in this book. So the first is this, and this is from book four. Uh, no spell can reawaken the dead. So the, these books are full of magic. They're full of um, wizards and spells and, and all that, and they can do the craziest things. And uh, it's, it, I mean, the imagination of of, of Rowling in, in in describing this world and, and all that you could do with magic. It's just it's astounding. But no spell can reawaken the dead. There, there's not a magic trick that can raise someone from the dead. So that that's clear. There's there's nothing. Once someone's dead, they can't come back. And and even when people die in these books, you, you kind of in the back of your mind, you're like, 
there's got to be some. Can't they just do something and and this person's not really dead. I mean, they're they're a main person. Like they're not really dead, right? Uh, but no spell can reawaken the dead. So that that's that's one of the rules. You can't do it. Uh, we we learn that Voldemort, the the evil guy, his his goal, one of his goals is to conquer death. So that's one of his. That's one thing he's seeking after. Um, <clears throat> Harry comes across his his parents' gravestones, and it says their names, their dates, that they lived and died. And then at the bottom, under both their names, it says, "The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death." And that is a straight biblical reference to in First Corinthians. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then Hermione, one of the one of Harry's uh, best friends. She says, uh, in, when they're discussing that the last enemy shall, that shall be destroyed is death, uh, it means this, you know, living beyond death, living after death. So that's what Hermione says, that the last enemy sh- that shall be destroyed is death. She, she says that means that living after death. We get in the, in the last book of the series is called The Deathly Hollows. There are three objects. If they are united, they will make the possessor master of death. And then at the end, we see Dumbledore calling Harry the master of death. It's just very interesting that, that, that uh, it, their gravestones, Harry's parents' gravestones, reference that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And so you, you see that throughout there, there's other sections where there, there's a straight, um, biblical quote and, and just these, these overarching ideas that, that show up throughout the book. That, that was something that stuck out to me. And, and I guess my one thing, the, the one thing I'll always remember about this series is just how these things were, were discussed and, and maybe just kind of thinking about them in a, in a unique way and and considering Harry's mother and and her sacrifice her sacri- sacrificing herself for her son that 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 transformed her blood that her blood could then protect her son from evil um the soul uh the the, the importance of of the soul and how yeah you you could you could split it you could give your soul to to other things you could give them to, to actual physical things you, uh, and, and Voldemort does that he puts his soul into physical objects but that is uh, the opposite of a soul uh, that that becomes the opposite of, of what a soul is actually supposed to be and then love no matter how how cheesy it may may sound uh, just love everybody man. Uh, love is the antidote to this evil. It, it's it's the the thing that can overcome the evil character in this book. And blood, how how blood goes throughout, and 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 then how death can be overcome. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So to recap, um, I I was extremely impressed by this series. Uh, I. I, I, there's one question uh, in a newsletter I, I get about books, and the question they ask everybody is, "What what series or what book would you like to read again for the first time?" And I, as I was going through the series, I, I was kind of, as I got closer to the end, I, there was almost this lament that was happening of, "I'm not going to be able to experience this again for the first time. Um, I'm enjoying it so much going through it, but I, I won't be able to to." to experience again, it again for the first time. Um, I, I did enjoy it. I, I, I was very impressed and, and it was a joy to, to go through it. My favorite book out of the series was the third one. Uh, I, I just thought the whole thing was incredible. Um, there were some, some of these ideas. Um, there's one where, where you face your fear by, by it, your fear appears in front of you, but then you, you come up with ways to laugh at it. And, uh, I thought that that was just a, a neat way to consider fears. But then the, the end of that book, book three, Harry is like outside of himself watching what he just did. And that helps that helps solve and, and uh, conclude that book. And it was just a brilliant way. I You know, you had just read what happened, but then Harry kind of he he's able to view it from the outside and see it from a different vantage point. 
And that was so neat. And, and to, again, to, to think of the, the imagination to, to be able to write something like that. And then to write about like memories, how memories can be taken out of the person's head and viewed by someone else, but really for the purpose of giving the larger story. So throughout the book, you think you know what happened, but then when that memory is, is, is extracted from someone's mind and then Harry can view it or Dumbledore can view that memory, it, it, it adds additional context and you get the fuller story, the, the bigger picture of, of what's going on. So there, there are just so many neat ideas like that in, in, in new ways of, of considering things or, or thinking about things. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I unfortunately went into this series just thinking it would be a children's series. Like, and, and I guess by that I meant, or I was thinking it would be like a dumbed down uh, series of books. And it was not that at all. Uh, in, in fact, it, I almost view this as more of, of like adult books than, than, than young adult. Um, but I was just very impressed with the, with the whole series. So I'm, I'm glad I read it. Uh, I've now this year, I've read the Chronicles of Narnia. I've read the Lord of the Rings and I've read the Harry Potter series. And, and it's just been a joy to go through all of those. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you if you especially if you've read the Harry Potter series. Love to hear your thoughts about it. Um, you can email me at eric at books of titans. Let me know what you, uh, dot com. Let me know what you thought. Uh, and, and you can support the podcast by, by helping me purchase my books for my 2022 reading list. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. And the website is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and create your own reading list. I'll be back in two weeks to discuss another book or series from my 2021 reading list. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.